A Bush Court Martial Riding along the narrow Māori tracks in the Uruweta country, through dense overshadowing bush, over the steep ranges, and in and out of the mountain streams, the veteran Captain Gilbert Mayer and I in 1921 revisited many of the fighting grounds of the Ho-Ho Wars. The gallant old soldier had carried carbine and swag at the head of his Aroa soldiers on many a hazardous trail in that huge jumbled up country of peak and ridge and canyon. He used to say he wished he had a pound for every mile he had chased Te Kōti through those mountains. He was 77 on this last long ride of ours together, but the memories of the days when he was in the ardour of youth and strength, the longest day was never then too long, seemed to revive something of the fighting fire, and Tawa told with animation many a story of the warpath and recited the chants of his Arawa men. The old scout passed over the last range of all two years later. One of Mayer's stories of the war trail, which I heard also at a later date from his old comrade Captain G. A. Priest, described his last encounter with Te Kōti's warrior band. The date was 15 August 1871, and the scene was a bush camp in the very wildest part of the eastern Uruweta territory, the valley of the Waipawa River, a tributary of the Ruakituri, away into the northeast of Lake Waikere Moana. He and Captain Priest, commanding a force of 90 Arawa constabulary, had searched for Te Kōti for weeks through that savage territory, in wintry weather, suffering much from the cold and wet. They often camped without lighting a fire, lest the enemy should discover their presence. The high country was all under snow. From a range top one morning, a scout who climbed a tree saw far in the wooded valley below a curl of blue smoke rising from some hidden camp and mingling with the mists of the mountains. With infinite caution, the force marched for the smoke, and late in the afternoon descended on the outlaw's hiding place. The camp of refuge was skillfully placed on a loop formed by the Waipawa River. A sharp elbow of land was defended on three sides by the river and on the other side by a trench running across the isthmus. The trench was about eight feet in width and the same in depth. A small stream came down in a waterfall into the main river at the end of the ditch. On the land side of this moat a hillock rose to a height of about 30 feet. Under the trees on this elevation there were two ho-ho sentries. Mayor and Priest could see the muzzles of their guns, which were left standing against a log. The camp was seen to consist of several large kaponga thern thatched whares, protected on the land side by a palisade of kaponga trunks set upright in the ground closely together just inside the trench and fastened with cross rails. Led by Mayor and Priest, the Ottawa rushed the camp. Mayer killed one of the sentries at once, and then shot and wounded a big burly fellow who was racing for the bush. Another man was killed, but most of the Ho-Hos escaped, among them to Kōti himself, who dashed into the river and across it into the forest. The Ottawa chased the fugitives, but as darkness was coming on they were recalled by the sound of the bugle. The snow lay deep on the mountains in the clearing and as the evening breeze increased in strength, masses came swishing down from the tree branches like small avalanches. In the bush camp, great fires were burning, and the blaze lit up as clearly as daylight a wild, savage scene. The shore kilted Arawa moved about the camp or sat in groups talking. Some were busy chopping up dry logs for firewood. Rude huts, roughly walled with fern tree trunks and roofed with totara bark, occupied a part of the stump-dotted clearing. The wall of the largest whare had been torn down to feed one of the fires, and in the half-shelter, in front of the fire, sat a group of women prisoners, most of whose men had escaped. One man alone remained prisoner. The big fellow Mayor had wounded, a truculent savage of a fellow with a huge bushy black beard. His left kneecap had been smashed by Mayor's bullet. His name was We Heretonga. He was a notorious ruffian who had killed women and children in the Poverty Bay and Mohaka massacres, and had killed his own wife. After the force had had some tea, Mayor was told that the wounded man was suffering greatly from his smashed kneecap. He took his satchel containing laudanum, coral, surgical needles and bandages, and went to the guard hut. 
He was preparing a powerful laudanum and brandy as a sedative when suddenly the prisoner thrust forward his right arm under Mez and began tugging at something in his belt. A quick-eyed sergeant, Rokoroko, saw that he was trying to draw a deadly knife over a foot long, but the haft had caught in the woven flax sheath. Shouting out a warning, Captain, you'll be killed! The Ottawa non-combatant placed the muzzle of his carbine to the prisoner's head, while Mayor threw himself backward out of his reach. The Ottawa soldiers were furious at this treacherous attack, and begged that Hiratonga be shot immediately. In the meantime, the women prisoners had informed Captain Priest of the dangerous character of the prisoner and his atrocious record. What shall we do about this scoundrel? Priest asked Mayor, after the two of them had heard what some of the women prisoners had to say about we Hiratonga. He certainly ought to be shot, said Mayor. We can't carry him out, and we can't leave him here to die. We had better try him by Drumhead Court Martial. And that was done. Drumhead was a figure of speech. Log Court Martial would have been more exact. Mayor did not wish to take part in the trial himself, so he and Priest decided to anticipate the lieutenancy for which they had already recommended Priest's trustworthy Sergeant Major H.P. Blewett formerly an officer in the Gold Coast Regiment, West Africa. The tribunal, composed of priests and Bluett, sat on a fallen tree trunk. Two women, Mere Maihi and Maura Iriangi, gave damning evidence. One of them described how, on the return of Tikoti's force from attacking Mohaka, Heretonga speared his own wife to death at Toaki. The prisoner certainly deserved shooting, and the court did not take long to convict him. It was, perhaps, strictly speaking, an illegal court, but in bush warfare many things had to be done without considering the strict letter of military law. In any case, said Mayor to me, we could not leave the prisoner there to die. Our men would never consent to carry their detested enemy out through that awful country. During the trial, the prisoner maintained a disdainful and patient attitude. After being sentenced to be shot, he was removed outside the camp. A fatigue party was detailed to dig the grave, and a large fire was lighted on the snowy ground. We sat by the fire warming himself. He taunted the gravediggers and boasted of the defeats his tribe had inflicted on the Arua people in the olden days, at Kai Fatsifati and Pukekai Kahu, where the Uruwera had feasted on the bodies of the slain and never suffered from reprisals. Digging the grave, shallow though it was, occupied a long time. The men had to cut through a mass of roots from the huge tower trees that overshadowed the camp. The prisoner presently became abusive. He spat at Mir and declared, Ha! Tawa, if I'd had my way I'd have scattered your brains as I scattered those of the people we killed at Gisborne and Mohaka. Now came a curious scene when the firing party of six were taking their places. Sergeant Rokoroko came up and, saluting Mir, asked permission to shoot the prisoner because it was he who had saved the captain from being stabbed. Then, Private Nikora Tetsuhi claimed the privilege of executing the sentence himself, for the reason that in 1869 we had murdered his, Nikora's, brother, Tetohia. This Tetohia was a gallant young fellow of Mare's Natirangitihi. He was captured by Tekoti's force at Tawaroa in the Rangitaiki Valley and was barbarously killed by Wee Heretonga, who beat his face into a pulp with a shingling hammer in the Ho-Ho Pa. Captain Mir felt strongly included to gratify Nikora's wish, but now there was a new development. There was a quite celebrated young Māori warrior in the contingent, a New Zealand crossman named Kepa Te Ahuru. He earnestly requested the right of putting the prisoner to death, and he gave these reasons. We Heretonga was a man of high rank in the Uruwera and Wairoa tribes, and his death at the hands of the Ottawa natives might engender bad feeling, prejudicing the efforts to obtain peace and preventing Tukoti's capture. He said, moreover, that his kippers, right, could not be questioned. He was the condemned man's nephew, the son of his sister. Therefore, according to Māori etiquette, it would be absolutely ticker, that is correct, for his uncle to die by his hand. If you permit any of the Arawa to shoot this man, he said, it will create a new feud between the Arawa and the Uruweta people and undo the efforts of yourself and Captain Priest to seal permanent peace. If I shoot him, no more will be said about it. 
for it will be agreed that I, a chief of Tuhoi, have a perfect right to remove a man who has disgraced us by his many evil deeds. Mayor and priests agreed to grant Kepa's request. Mayor thought he saw a softening expression of composure and relief overspread the prisoner's countenance. Heretaunga quite mildly asked for a smoke. Many pipes were offered to him. He took one and smoked away nonchalantly. Kepa Te Ahuru stripped to his waist shawl and begging the loan of Mayor's carbine, strode up and down before the condemned man. The carbine was a Wesley Richard Snyder sent to Mayor by Sir Cosmo Gordon of Scotland for some kindness he had shown to his nephew Cosmo Gordon, first lieutenant of HMS Rosario. After parading back and forward, the executioner halted abruptly before we Heretaunga and addressed him in these words. You should be content, and may consider yourself fortunate that you are to die by the hands of a chief of equal rank, your own nephew, who will send you like a chieftain to the night. In Te Kepa Te Ahuru's words, Kawaimari e koe mato iramutsu e tukuranga tira ki te pō. But for me, you would have been slain by those plebeian people, the Arawa. So spoke Kepa Te Ahuru punctuating his speech by jumping in the air, his eyes glaring in the pukana grimace, his tongue protruding. He told the prisoner that he would be honoured by being killed with the captain's carbine. We Heretaunga smoked quietly, plucky and defiant to the end. At last, Te Ahuru advanced slowly and, placing the muzzle of the carbine close to Wee's body, pressed the trigger and the prisoner fell back shot through the heart.